Okay, so as Fred mentioned, uh, my name is Brian Doherty. I'm a field ag engineer with ISU Extension Outreach. And the topic today is uh, heat stress abatement strategies for dairy cattle. So what I'm gonna do uh, basically is just briefly go through some of the causes and symptoms of heat stress. And then we'll get into the details of how you alleviate heat stress, uh, some information on ventilation design I'll talk about the pros and cons of natural versus mechanical ventilation. And then we'll get into how to provide sufficient airspeed in the cow resting area. And then I'll wrap up with some information on other cooling strategies that you can use. So just some of the basics here, you know, why does heat stress occur? Basically cows have a, a comfort zone essentially somewhere in the 40 to 70 or 75 degree Fahrenheit range, depending on humidity. And at that point, their body heat produces roughly equal the amount that they can get rid of or heat loss to the environment. But when the temperature humidity index gets over 68, they generally basically are producing more body heat than they're able to get rid of. And so if we think about it, it's really just a math problem, you know, so there's metabolic heat generation feed you know, in the process of digesting that, that produces energy and heat. And, you know, when that plus the amount of heat she's taking in from the environment is greater than her ability to get rid of that heat, you have heat stress. So I'm sure you've all probably seen this chart before, but I think it's important to just keep reminding ourselves that cows do feel heat stress before we do. So if you see the top of the chart there, you know, what I would consider perfect weather, you know, low to mid 70s Fahrenheit, very comfortable for us. You know, you just got to remind yourself that your cows are already getting into the heat stress range at that point. So we've got to start mitigating that heat stress early on before we even consider it to be hot ourselves. Symptoms of heat stress. So there's sort of immediate symptoms and more longer term symptoms or consequences of heat stress. So immediately we generally see reduced feed intake, drop in milk production. You know, those are usually the first two things you'll notice. You know, some reduced fat and protein levels in the milk, you know, body temperature starts to increase, the respiration rate starts to increase. And when they get to the point where they're at 100 breaths per minute or greater, they're in the danger zone at that point. So you've got to get those cows cooled off immediately in that case. The other issue here is the longer it stays hot, especially when it doesn't cool down at night, you know, the more stressful it is. So if, if it does cool off for, you know, three or more nights in a row, you know, that, that makes that heat stress even more severe. So longer term, you know, there's also issues here and they can be a significant economic drain, you know, over and above your short-term milk production loss loss of body condition, you know, poor reproductive performance, impaired immune function, hoof health problems, you know, and that, that poor immune function can lead to, you know, just greater susceptibility to other types of infections. Um, a study estimated about $200 per cow annual loss here in the United States from heat stress. So this is a significant economic concern on top of the, the welfare concerns with uh, keeping those cows cool and comfortable. And it's, I just want to remind people that, you know, most of this presentation is going to focus on lactating cows and those types of facilities, but we also need to make sure we're trying to keep our dry cows and our young stock cooled as well. There's more and more research coming out showing that, you know, cooling those dry cows and those pre-fresh cows is absolutely critical. You know, they have better immune function, lower somatic cell count when they calve in, but probably even more importantly, if they're cool during the dry period, they actually have healthier calves. And then those calves go on to be healthier. They grow faster. You know, they absorb colostrum better. And then when they're bred, they conceive faster. And when they calve in two years later, they produce more milk after calving. So this is a long-term effect from that heat stress on these dry cows. So absolutely critical to pay attention to that as well. And then your young stock, you know, there's also research showing that those calves, if they're, they're cooled, you know, they'll gain more weight during the summer as well. So how do we eliminate heat stress? This is pretty much my whole presentation. 
you know, in, in one slide here, essentially. So th this is the same math problem I showed before. And so what we want to do basically is make those numbers on the left smaller so that heat intake from the environment, we want to reduce that. And the numbers on the right side, we want to make those bigger. You know, we need to flip the equation here so that the, the heat, metabolic heat produced plus the heat intake from the environment is less than her ability to get rid of that heat. So it's really just kind of a math problem if you, it's a simple way to think about it. And so how do we do that on the left side? The main thing you can do there is provide shade, reduce that direct solar radiation, you know, that, that's hitting that cow. And then on the right side, provide lots of fresh water, fresh, fast moving air and evaporative cooling. So that this is basically the equation that we need to solve or that, you know, that we need to work on that right side, especially to help that cow get rid of that heat and, and you know, balance the equation here. So if you've ever wondered why cows back off on feed when they're heat stressed, this is why. If she keeps eating the same amount of feed and she can't get rid of that excess heat, she will eventually overheat and die. So that cow has no choice but to back off on feed intake if she's not able to get rid of that heat to the environment. So heat stress priority areas. Now this is gonna vary by farm depending on what you've already invested in and what you haven't. But in general, this is the order that I would prioritize things. Lots of fresh, clean water first, and that applies to every animal on the farm. Second place I would target is the holding area. That's probably the most stressful area on the farm when it comes to heat stress. Those cows are packed in there close together. It's just that much harder for them to get rid of that heat. So target the holding area. It's not as big of an area. It won't be as expensive to ventilate that as your entire barn. The third place I would look at is the milking parlor. Again, cows are close together, but you've also got the comfort of your workers to you know, factor in there as well. You know, if it's 110 degrees in the parlor, you're gonna have a hard time convincing people that they wanna be in there milking cows. So I would target the milking parlor third. And then I'd actually target the dry cows because of everything I talked about before. You know, again, if, if you've got a pre-fresh pen or a dry cow pen, it's not that big of an area. You know, you can get a lot of bang for your buck cooling those cows when you figure in all of those long-term benefits of doing that. Then I would focus on the, the resting area for your lactating herd out in the freestall barn or bedded pack, whatever you have. Then I'd target the feed alley with you know both fans and sprinklers, and then the young stock would be last. And the general you know, priority here is, you know, again, make sure you got enough water first, then add ventilation, then increase your air velocity, and then add sprinklers. So now I'll get into some of the details of how you make this work on the farm. You know, how do you design your ventilation to, you know, abate heat stress? But it's important to talk about what do we mean by ventilation when I say that. So ventilation is the provision of fresh air into a building space. So that's different than recirculating air. So you see the pictures on the bottom there, the bottom right, these re hanging recirculation fans, they're very common. They can really benefit for cow cooling, but they, they are not ventilation fans. They're basically just recirculating air that's already in the barn. Ventilation needs to displace that heat and moisture and noxious gases, airborne pathogens, and get those out of the barn. So when we talk about ventilation, that, that's what I'm talking about. Why do we need to improve ventilation? Well, bottom line, cows generate a lot of heat. So and a lot of the prior research is getting pretty outdated as far as the heat production estimates from dairy cattle. And we've got a lot of new technology now as well that, that we can use to improve ventilation, variable speed fans, lots of you know, more sophisticated controllers and sensors. But if you look at the, the graph on the bottom right there, you know, a cow milking 120 pounds per day, they're putting out over 6,000 BTUs of heat per hour. So the way I like to kind of visualize this is that look at that heater on the right that's a 5100 BTU per hour heater so essentially every cow in your barn is one of those heaters so think about it that way and then think about okay all of those heaters are running how do I get that heat out of the barn so goals for reducing heat stress 
I already mentioned ventilation. We need ventilation to exhaust that heat and moisture out of the barn to maintain that favorable environment for heat loss. We wanna focus on getting that resting body temperature, that, that core basal body temperature down to, you know, somewhere in the 102.2 range, you know, or what's considered normal at some point in the day, every day for every cow. So generally during the night is when it's gonna be the coolest. You need to keep cooling those cows throughout the night, especially on these, you know, long stretches of hot weather. And then the third priority is try to keep those cows laying down during the summer in that hot weather. So why is it important to keep them lying down? You know, most of us I'm sure are aware that cows do have, you know, more milk production generally when they lie down longer, more blood flow through the udder. But the problem here is that cows accumulate heat when they're lying down because they have less of their body surface exposed to the environment. So it's harder for them to get rid of that heat. And then when they stand up, they, they you know, have more body surface exposed. It's easier for them to cool down. So the other issue is that they generally gain heat at about twice the rate when they're lying down as they can get rid of that heat when they're standing up. So the chart here shows, you know, about a one degree Fahrenheit per hour, you know, change in body temperature when that cow is lying down. Standing up in the holding pen, it's about neutral. And then standing up out in the barn, they can get rid of that heat at a rate of about a half a degree per hour. So, you know, we want the cows to be lying down to produce more milk, but we have to keep in mind they're, you know, it's harder for them to get rid of heat when they're laying in the stalls. So I'm gonna get into natural ventilation now, where we can use that, what some of the challenges are with it. So when, we're, when I'm talking about natural ventilation, generally this is gonna be a curtain-sided barn with open eaves, open ridge vent. You know, you want a good pitch on the roof, 412 or greater, because that helps that hot air move up and escape out the ridge vent. But for summertime, what's more important here is you know, you want to be free from wind shadows or take those into account. Generally, an east to west orientation here in the Midwest is what you want. It gets you better exposure to your prevailing winds out of the south, and it protects those cows from that, that summer sun, you know, kind of late afternoon. It keeps them in the shade. And you want your sidewalls to be fully open during the summer, as, as open as possible. So I mentioned heat shadows or uh, wind shadows rather. Uh, so this is a chart kind of you can use to kind of guesstimate what kind of a wind shadow that a building would produce. So generally the longer a building is and the taller the building is, the more of a wind shadow it's gonna create. So just as an example here, the way you use this chart, if you've got a, a barn that's 150 feet long and it's 30 feet tall, it's going to create a wind shadow of about 150 feet. So if you'd want to, if you're going to build another barn next to it, you'd want to keep it 150 feet away. So this is just kind of a ballpark number that you can use to estimate how much of a wind shadow you're going to have from a building. And here's some work from uh, John Tyson at Penn State University Extension looking at this uh, natural ventilation factor. And so this is a good way to assess your barn if you've got a naturally ventilated barn and see if, if your natural ventilation is adequate or if you need some improvements. So I won't go through the whole calculation here. You can, you can find this online, but basically it takes into account, you know, how large your ventilation openings are, your sidewall openings, you know, how is that barn oriented to the prevailing winds and, you know, what's the terrain around that barn like? Are there hills and other things blocking that wind? And then you can come up with a score that basically tells you if your natural ventilation is adequate or if it's compromised or greatly compromised, you're almost certainly in that case gonna want to add some mechanical ventilation to help out. The other issue with natural ventilation during the summer is that sometimes the wind just doesn't blow. So this is a wind rose and this shows wind speed and direction. So I just pulled up uh, the wind rose from Dubuque, Iowa here where I'm located for August. And so just over 11% of the time in August in Dubuque, Iowa, we have what we would essentially consider to be still air, less than five miles per hour. And so this is the hottest time of the year. So 
11 percent of the time we don't have enough wind blowing through that building essentially to help naturally ventilate that barn so this is another one of the challenges with natural ventilation so that brings us to mechanical ventilation and how we can use that to either supplement or entirely replace natural ventilation depending on how you want to manage that system so why would you consider mechanical ventilation? Lots of different reasons. The picture in the bottom there is, is a good example of, you know, what we tend to see in a lot of farms. Buildings get put where you have room for them. They're not always oriented the way you would prefer to catch that natural ventilation. A lot of times we have buildings that are close together. They're blocking those prevailing winds. You know, there's a small footprint to get that building in there. Sometimes you have to squeeze it into a tight space. So those are all situations where you might want to add some mechanical ventilation. It also can help reduce problems with flies and birds and cow bunching and things like that. And I'm going to talk about bunching more later in the presentation. It generally just gives you more control over that barn environment. So there's a couple different approaches to mechanically ventilating a barn. You can do a positive or neutral pressure system where basically those fans are forcing air into the building. So they're creating a positive pressure in the building and then that air escapes through openings. Or in the case of a neutral pressure system, you also have fans pulling that air back out. You know, we used to call this a push-pull ventilation system. That Those are pretty uncommon in, in dairy facilities, but you can probably find a few out there. The other option that's more common here in the Midwest is a negative pressure system. So those fans are sucking air out of the barn and then that there's an air inlets to bring fresh air in on the opposite end. So a tunnel barn or a cross ventilated barn would be an example of a negative pressure system. So tunnel ventilation, you know, there's definitely pros and cons to this. You know, this is where you're gonna draw that air along the length of the barn parallel to the feed lane. You're generally gonna locate those fans on the north or the east end of the barn. So you're not fighting against your prevailing winds in the summertime. The advantage here is these are pretty easy to retrofit into existing barns, a four row barn or six row barn. You've generally got enough end wall space there to mount those fans to make this work. And there's also an option to uh, have what we'd call a hybrid system. So you can still naturally ventilate it during the winter. You do have to have the ability to close your eaves and your ridge to make that work. So you want those closed when you're in tunnel mode so you don't have air short circuiting. But if you have a way to open those back up and, and open your sidewalls back up, you know, during cool conditions, you can do a, a hybrid system with this. Drawbacks of the tunnel ventilation it can be really challenging to get that air speed where you want it down where the cows are. So the air tends to want to kind of sail over the top of the cows down the center feed lane rather than in the stalls where you really need it. There can be some distribution issues depending on your inlet location. You know, if you've got any connector lanes going to other buildings, those can act as an inlet, kind of short circuit your airflow. Wall obstructions at crossovers are another problem. Again, they're going to block that airflow in the stalls where you really want that, that airspeed. And there is a, a kind of a maximum that you can get away with in a tunnel barn, somewhere around 500 feet. Now, when you get beyond that, you're going to start having pretty poor air quality by the time you get to the opposite end of the barn. And I'll get into this more later, but baffles generally don't really work that well in a tunnel ventilated barn. There's also cross ventilation. This is starting to become more popular here in the Midwest. You know, basically you take a tunnel design and turn it on its side. So you're drawing that air across the barn perpendicular to the feed lane. The advantage here is you can go with a much wider barn. You know, again, you're still going to have those fans on the north or east side. You know, evaporative cooling pads is an option here because of the way they're designed. We generally don't see those much in the Midwest because we have very high humidity here and they tend to not be very beneficial. And in the case of a cross ventilated barn, you definitely can use baffles to, you know, get that airspeed down in the stalls where you need it, but you get beyond 16 rows or so, and that gets to be a real challenge. Drawbacks with cross ventilation, you know, again, there's, there's always gonna be somewhere where there's potential for air to bypass where you want it. 
your transfer lanes, you know, you've got to get your baffles in the right place. And economically, it, it's generally cheaper per stall to go wider, but at some point you're going to hit hit a point where you're going to have a hard time ventilating that barn if you get it too wide. You know, you can have low airspeed, you know, downwind of that center feed bunk. And then the other issue with cross ventilated barns, there's generally no option for naturally ventilating these. You know, the, the ridge is completely closed. They have a fairly shallow roof pitch. And so you have to also mechanically ventilate them throughout the winter. And that can be a challenge sometimes. I mentioned hybrid systems. So there's lots of different ways to go about this. You can use uh, high volume, low speed fans. You can use cupolas. You know, you can use hanging recirculation fans. It's just kind of any system that has, you know, some elements of both natural and mechanical ventilation. So if you build these barns new, they do tend to be fairly expensive, but they do have some advantages, give you a little bit better ability to control the environment in the barn. This is a newer design. It's actually a positive pressure barn, which is pretty unusual in the dairy industry. But the way this facility works is when it's under 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it's just a naturally ventilated barn. Ridge is open, sidewalls are open. Then when it gets over 70, you close the barn up and then you have these fans forcing air into the barn, pointing directly at the row of stalls. So this is a nice design for a four row barn. And it's, it's you know, there's some of these being built in the Southeast US. It is a very expensive design, but you know, it does have a lot of benefits. It's very good at keeping those cows cooled during the summer. There's also positive pressure tube systems. Now these generally aren't thought of as being used for, you know, cooling during the summer, but you can do it. They are an option for, you know, kind of small tight spaces, low ceilings. Sometimes you can make these work. Maybe your barn's a, a funky angle or an L shape or something like that, where it's hard to ventilate otherwise mechanically. So there are some situations where you can use these positive pressure tubes to get airspeed into the stalls where you need it. But generally it's not something that you would do in, in a new facility build. This would be more of a, a retrofit or remodel type situation. So practical design recommendations for mechanical ventilation. There, there's two different schools of thought here on designing these. So one approach is to look at the air changes per hour, and that's the most common way that it's done now. So somewhere around 40 to 60 air changes per hour in the summertime is kind of what we shoot for with tunnel and cross ventilated barns. The other approach you can use is air exchange per unit of body weight. So for example, about 1500 CFMs cubic feet per minute of airflow per cow is what we would target in that case. You can also look at your inlet airspeed. You want that to be somewhere around 500 feet per minute coming into the barn. If it's a tunnel or a cross vent barn, you know, you want enough air speed that you get good air mixing when that fresh air comes in. But if that speed gets to be too high, you know, you can actually start creating excessive negative pressure in the barn and start restricting the airflow from your fans. So it's a bit of a, a fine balance there, getting the right opening size so you get that inlet air speed where you want it. But the main thing here with, with any of these systems is we need to focus on getting good air speed in the stalls, in the resting area where the cows are. That's really what's important. So I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on how we can do this with some of these different ventilation systems. So ventilation research for hot weather has found that there's significant benefit going from you know, still air up to about 200 feet per minute of airspeed. And then you get beyond that, there's, you know, still some benefit or, you know, basically not much benefit they can still detect when you get beyond 400 feet per minute of airspeed. And economically, you're going to hit a point where you just can't justify moving air, you know, at a certain point, you know, throughout the entire barn. It's just more efficient to target airspeed in those specific areas where you need it rather than trying to bump the airspeed through the whole barn. There's also some behavioral effects to take into account here. So cows do like fast moving air. 
you know, if you've got some hanging fans, you've probably seen your cows laying directly in that air jet in hot weather. They like that fast moving air. So there's a behavioral aspect there, you know, beyond just airspeed, but we don't have a lot of research kind of tell us what's going on there other than we just kind of know cows do like that fast moving air. But the University of Wisconsin Dairyland Initiative has, has done a lot of work looking at this and they've come up with this concept called the minimum cooling airspeed. And they're suggesting that should be about 200 feet per minute or 2.25 miles per hour. And for our metric friends joining today, that's about one meter per second airspeed. So we wanna aim for that airspeed across the entire resting area within the barn and try to identify those areas where we're below that and then supplement some ventilation or you know, do some different strategies to get that airspeed where we need it. So I mentioned the fast moving air, you know, just kind of conceptually, this makes sense. You know, blowing air across a surface of any sort that's heated is gonna help cool that surface by, you know, convection. So if you think about, you got a cup of coffee in the morning and you wanna drink it, but it's too hot, what do you do? You blow on it. You know, it's, it's the same concept here. We, we wanna blow air on those cows and they do like that fast moving air, you know, so there's a behavioral aspect to that as well. So I mentioned, you know, the economics of this, it is difficult to justify adding additional fans to get much beyond 40 or 50 air changes per hour. It's just more effective, more economical to direct that airflow where you need it. And you can do that in different ways with different barns. And I'll go into some of the details on these, but you can, you know, change the location of your inlets to get more air if you're needed in certain places. You know, that's an option for your, your tunnel and cross ventilated barns. You know, you certainly want to use baffles in cross ventilated barns. And I'll get into the details on that in a minute. I mentioned the positive pressure tubes. If you've got a, just an area that you just can't get air to otherwise, you know, because of obstructions or low ceilings or things like that, you might be able to make a positive pressure tube work. And there's also the high volume, low speed fans. So these are the, you know, very large diameter ceiling fans. Those are an option. They're generally not optimized for, you know, getting good air speed or, you know, fast moving air in the stalls. And I'll, again, I'll talk about that more in a minute as well. And then there's also the hanging recirculation fans. I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about those. That's our most common one that we would see here in the Midwest. And you can make those work in most situations unless you've got a very low ceiling or some other challenge where you can't get those fans to work. So getting that minimum cooling airspeed in tunnel and cross ventilated barns. So in tunnel barns, if you look at that picture on the top right there, you know, this barn has baffles in it. So what happens is you have good airspeed, you know, you'll hit that baffle, you'll have fast airspeed under the baffle, but then that air just comes back up again once it gets beyond the baffle. So if you think about how many stalls are underneath that baffle, you know, it, it's cutting across the barn. So there's not actually that many stalls under the baffle. And so you're, you're getting a limited amount of cooling with those baffles in that case. So uh, the Darylene Initiative, again, has done a lot of modeling on this, looking at these, you know, different ventilation systems. And they've, they're, they're suggesting that those baffles don't have much of an effect on this minimum cooling airspeed in a tunnel barn. So in that case, you probably want to use some recirculation fans or other, other ways to target that airspeed in those, you know, crossover walls and areas like that where you're, where you're low on your airspeed. In a cross vent barn, on the other hand, absolutely want to use baffles. So if you look at the bottom right photo there, that baffle's running, you know, parallel to those stalls, the full length of the barn. So that one baffle is going to cool that entire row of stalls. And again, through some modeling work that the Dairyland Initiative did, they found that the best way to put those baffles in is just to orient them perpendicular or straight up and down directly over the center of those head-to-head -head stalls. I mentioned the high volume, low speed fans, and you know, those do help keep your barn cooler, but generally, you know, these are moving fairly slow. They kind of, you know, give you a nice gentle breeze over a fairly large area. 
but because of the airflow pattern with these and, and that circular nature of that airflow pattern, it doesn't necessarily line up with your your linear stall, you know, design. So again, here's some work from the Dairyland Initiative. And basically what this is showing is, you know, they took airspeed measurements in different places in the barn with these fans. So where you see a blue dot, that was over 200 feet per minute. So that was good. Where you see a red dot, that airspeed was not sufficient. So the bottom line is here, you know, if you're going to use these fans, you want to space them no more than twice the diameter of that fan apart. So if you've got a 20 foot diameter fan, no more than 40 feet apart on those fans. I mentioned the positive pressure tubes. You know, this is an option, you know, to target some fast moving air directly into those stalls, but you're gonna be very limited on the amount of volume that, of air that you can push into a barn because you've only got one fan that you can put on that tube. And so th again, it is an option in certain areas that you can make this work, but you know, the, the air volume that you can move is gonna be fairly limited. And the area that you can achieve that airspeed is also gonna be fairly limited. So that brings us to recirculation fans. These are the most common type that we see here in the Midwest. So if you look at that picture there in the left, you know, somebody, maybe somebody can type in the chat box and tell me what's wrong with that fan. So basically all that fans blowing is money the way I see it. So that fan needs to be angled downward. So you're getting that airspeed aim directly at the stalls where the cows are. If you've just got it hanging, you know, perpendicular, you know, it, it's not really achieving anything when it comes to cooling those cows down. That fan has to be pointed at the stall platform in order to be effective. And this is a very common issue I see, you know, going in free stall barns. Those fans just don't have enough of an angle on them to really get that airflow down in the stalls where it's needed. So again, more work from the Dairyland Initiative here, looking at you know the height and the spacing and the angle of these fans. It's absolutely critical to make these work. So again, you want to target those areas where you've got airflow obstructions. You know the divider walls around waters. That's a great place to use these fans. Even if you've got a tunnel ventilated barn, you know we're we're seeing more and more of these put in tunnel barns as well, just to deal with those problem areas. And so you have to think about how far apart you're putting these fans and what angle you have on those fans. So they've also looked at, you know, is it better to do a single fan every 24 feet versus a double fan every 48 feet? And again, took airspeed measurements in the stalls here. And there wasn't a lot of difference between the two, but that there was a little bit of a, an edge to having that single fan every 24 feet versus you know double fans every 48 48 feet's just a little bit too far apart on the spacing for those fans you know that they can only throw air so far you know depending on the diameter of the fan and, and at some point you're going to be below that target airspeed so current recommendations here are to use a you know somewhere in the neighborhood of 48 to 55 inch you know hanging fan if you're going to use these recirculation fans over every row of stalls and space them no more than 30 feet apart. So 24 to 30 feet is ideal on these. You know, again, they need to be angled. So they're pointing at the stall below the fan, the next fan in the row. And you wanna turn those on at 68 degrees, you know, cause that's when cows start, you know, experiencing that heat stress, even if we think it's comfortable. So this picture in the bottom, this is actually my uh, family farm here. So this barn was built in 2001 when I designed this. And at that time, you know, the recommendation was 40 feet on the spacing. But if you look at this barn by today's standards, you know, we're, we're continually updating these recommendations. You know, cows are producing more milk, they're producing more body heat. So by today's standards, these fans are too far apart and they don't have enough of an angle on them. So if you're going to be retroing or building a new facility, you know, just keep in mind, you, you might want to space those fans a little bit closer together. The other option you can do for these recirculation fans are these large, you know, some people refer to them as cyclone fans, you know, the big 72 inch diameter fans, you can get up to 60 feet apart on these, you know, it makes for less wiring, a little bit cleaner space in the barn. 
but the key to making these work if you can see in the picture there it's got some you know baffles on the front of that fan or some louvers to kind of direct that airflow and spread it out more so you definitely need those on these larger fans if you're going to try to space them further apart you got to still be able to direct that airflow where it's needed the other issue here is that cows do act as a baffle and they, you know, they're going to impact that airflow. So at some point, again, you're going to, you're going to run into issues with how far apart you can put these fans. So briefly going to mention fan performance, you know, the economics of this is important and your fan choice can have a big impact on your operating costs, depending on how much electricity they use. So, there can be a difference of $30 per cow per year or more, you know, depending on which fan you choose. So if you're going to buy new fans, definitely want to pay attention, not only to the cost of the fan, but what's the efficiency in this CFM per watt or cubic feet per minute per watt is a good indicator for looking at fan efficiency. So if we just look at the top row there, the circulation fans, for example, average CFM per watt was 24 and a half. But the range for 11 different fans they looked at was plus or minus 2.4. So anywhere from 22 to 27. So that's a big range, depending on which fan you select. So definitely pay attention to that if you're going to be purchasing some fans. The other decision you have to make is whether you're going to use a belt drive fan or a direct drive fan. We mostly see belt drive fans for these recirculation fans. You, you can get both. There's more options with belt drive and the belt drive fans generally have a higher efficiency rating, but you also have belt maintenance to deal with. So if you're going to buy belt drive fans, you know, just make sure that you're going to keep those belts maintained, keep them tight so that you're actually getting that efficiency out of that fan. You know, if you don't want to deal with the belt maintenance, then I would encourage people to, you know, purchase direct drive fans. So other ways to keep your cows cool, you know, sprinkler and soaker systems, you know, once you've got good ventilation, you've got good airspeed in the stalls, this would be the next step. But, you know, the holding area in particular is the first area I would target, even if you don't have sprinklers in the main barn, it's not a very big area. You can get a lot of bang for your buck with evaporative cooling with these sprinkler and soaker systems in the holding area. So that would be the first place I would target then your return lanes, and then the, the feed alley after that. And the reason this works is because it takes about 1,000 BTUs of energy to evaporate a pound of water. So think back to our math equation or that, that heater example in the barn and the, how many BTUs that cow is putting out. So if you wet her down with a pound of water and then let that evaporate off of her skin, that's going to take about 1,000 BTUs of heat to do that. So it helps that cow get rid of that heat. So if you're going to install these, again, turn them on early. Don't wait until it's mid 70s. You know, it might seem cold to us. It's comfortable for those cows. Turn them on at 68 degrees. I definitely encourage, at least here in the Midwest, use a low pressure system with a large droplet size. So avoid the misters and the foggers. Those are more common and, and work better in more dry climates, arid climates, you know, Southwest US. But here in the Midwest, it's very humid. And what tends to happen with these misters, they make a very fine droplet size and it can actually end up just kind of creating a seal or a coat on that, on that cow's hair and it can actually trap heat rather than help her get rid of it. So you need to wet them down to the skin and to do that, you need a large droplet size. So shoot for somewhere around half a gallon per minute per nozzle. And then this is critical, especially in the holding area. Never put sprinklers in a holding area unless you also have fans. Because if you don't have fans to move air and help evaporate that water off of that cow, all you're doing is adding to the humidity and adding to the problem. So these definitely need to go hand in hand. You have to have fans first before you put your sprinklers in. The other key to making sprinklers work is they need to cycle on and off. So the benefit you get from soaking that cow is the evaporation. So you need to allow time for that evaporation to happen. So you don't want to wet them down continuously because that's counterproductive. So cycle it on for two or three minutes long enough to get that cow wetted down to the skin and then cycle it off for 15 to 20 minutes to let that water evaporate. So it seems a little counterintuitive. The, 
you know, it's kind of instinctive to want to just keep wetting them down because we think that'll help, but that's actually counterproductive. You have to give them time to let that water evaporate off their skin. And then, you know, as the temperatures increase and get hotter, you can shorten up those cycle times. I do want to mention maintenance because this is one of the biggest issues I see when I get on farms and it's one of the most overlooked management activities on the farm is maintaining those sprinklers and fans. So dust buildup on your fans can just kill your, your air output from that fan and your efficiency up to 40% or more, depending on the fan and how dusty it is. And then loose belts is another thing that I see quite regularly. And I mentioned, you know, belt maintenance earlier. So, you know, once that belt starts slipping, that the air output from that fan, it, it's not a linear decrease. Once that fan starts to slow down, you know, the air output from that fan drops off exponentially. So you've got to keep those belts tight, keep them well maintained. And there, there's just, you know, more issues than, than just the air output. You know, it also makes your motors run hot, wears that fan out faster if it's caked in dust and, and the belt slipping. The other thing you want to make sure you maintain, keep an eye on is any controllers, thermostats, things like that you have in your system. You know, they're, they're not going to function properly if they're coated with dust. So you need to make sure you clean those off as well. And I guess the, the main point I would try to drive home or try to encourage people here is just put somebody in charge of fan maintenance and put it on the schedule. That way, you know, some the buck's got to stop with somebody to make sure these fans get cleaned and get maintained. You know, fully mechanical systems, you should, probably should be cleaning those and servicing those monthly because you're depending on that mechanical system for all of your ventilation. You know, if you're just in a natural ventilated situation with some hanging recirculation fans, you know, at least once a year, you know, in the springtime before it gets hot, you're going to want to clean those, check your belts, you know, grease any grease circs you have, things like that. So once per year minimum and, and more would be better on those hanging fans. So we don't want to forget about our dry cows and young stock, you know, cooling strategies there. Again, the main thing you can do here is lots of fresh, clean water. It's hard to give ventilation recommendations for, you know, dry cows and young stock just because we have such a wide variety of facilities and buildings that these are housed in. A lot of them are out on pasture during the summer, but Again, just make sure you're providing shade in some form or another. If you've got three-sided, you know, monoslope barns, we see those pretty commonly. Make sure that back wall's opened up as much as possible to take advantage of those prevailing winds. And then after that, if you want additional cooling, you know, just follow the things I've talked about with fans and sprinklers, increase the ventilation rate, increase the airspeed. So I want to just briefly talk about bunching. I know we're getting to the end of the program here, but this is something we get calls on during the summer when it's hot. There's well, generally uh, four different things that can kind of cause cows to bunch. So heat stress, you know, it, all the things I've been talking about with heat stress, if those cows are stressed, they're going to want to bunch. It's kind of a natural instinct. Biting flies is another one lack of fresh air, again, poor ventilation, and possibly light avoidance. So we think what's going on there is, you know, cows are naturally grazing animals, and so they equate very bright light with hot conditions, even if it maybe isn't. So when they're stressed and it's hot, they'll seek out darker areas of the barn. It's like a shade tree for them. So that, that's something you got to keep in mind when you're trying to prevent those cows from bunching. So Again, heat stress abatement, plenty of fresh water, fast moving air, sprinklers, all the things I've talked about. Try to keep your light evenly distributed. Make sure you've got good fly control. And then this last one, I've got a couple of question marks on it. So this is anecdotal, but there, there's been some work done at, you know, the engineers at Penn State University have had a few farms that have tried this. They've actually turned half of their fans around, so they've got airflow going in two different directions. And they have had some success in getting those cows to spread out when they've done that. Again, they, they like to face into that air. So if all your air is moving in one direction, those cows tend to want to crowd to the end of the barn where that airflow is coming from. So if you change up that airflow direction, that, that could be a strategy. Again, I'm, 
there, there's no published research on this. This is just anecdotal evidence that this has worked in some facilities. So it might be something to consider. If, if anybody here in Iowa is interested in giving that a try, let me know. I'd be happy to come out and install a time-lapse camera and we can do some before and after analysis and uh, see if that strategy works. So just to wrap up here, you know, we've got to change the equation on heat stress. You know, we got to make sure that that heat input plus, you know, metabolic input from heat is less than her ability to get rid of that heat. Cows generate a lot of heat, got to get it out of the barn. So do a facility assessment, you know, whether you're natural or mechanically ventilated, take some airspeed measurements, you know, figure out where you've got challenges within the barn and target those areas for improvement. You know, natural ventilation is a great option. You've got natural light in the barn. You've got good airflow generally, except for those few days where you just don't get good airspeed. So add mechanical ventilation as needed in that case to target those high stress areas, provide that 200 foot per minute airspeed in the resting area, you know, buy efficient fans, keep them maintained, and then add sprinklers for evaporative cooling in those high stress areas. So some resources, you can always check out the Iowa State University Extension Dairy Team website. Lots of good information there on facilities and, and lots of nutritional things and other other information you can find there and i've also i've mentioned the university of wisconsin dairyland initiative several times and I want to give a shout out to them a lot of this work i've presented today is has come from research that they've done they've got a great website with some housing modules that talk about facility design and heat stress so i'd encourage you to check that out as well so with that, I'm going to wrap it up here, and I believe we've got some time for questions. Uh, got a bunch of questions, so I'll go ahead and get into them while folks are typing more. Uh, the initial question was, which uses less energy, cross or tunnel ventilation barns? And we had a response from the listener who said uh, almost the same uh, it depends on the number of animals and location. Uh, Brian, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, it depends is, is our standard answer for everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, generally, a, a tunnel barn, you might have a few less fans, but again, it's going to depend on how those barns are designed. You know, cross-ventilated barns can be very efficient depending on how wide they are. So the wider it is, you know, the more efficient it is for airflow because your number of fans is the same regardless. So... That's the really real advantage with those cross vent barns. You know, you can you can make them pretty wide, and you don't have to add any extra fans. So, depends on the design is the answer. Okay, what if the farm is mostly pasture based? What options might be available to use? Uh, we had uh, a response from uh, the audience that. Uh, points out that uh, prefer to have panel fans over stalls, but we have to be paying attention to the THI. Yeah, as far as the pasture-based systems, you know, you can always do the movable shades are a good option. So, you know, it is an expense, but it's certainly something that you want to consider, I would say, for the summertime, those real hot days. And then just make sure you got plenty of water. That's the other main thing with pasture. Those cows have to walk. You know, if you're doing a, you know, a rotational grazing type system, you know, try to get a setup so you've got water in every paddock so those cows aren't having to walk, you know, too far to get to water. So lots of water and shade are your, your best bets in a grazing system. Okay. Another question, uh, especially in hotter regions, we've seen uh, housing facilities that are sprinkling water on the roof of the facility. What's your thoughts on that? What are we accomplishing there? That is a good question. I've never actually come across that, so I don't really have any experience there. Okay. And I would assume they're just trying to reduce the, the heat load off of the, the steel on the roof. But again, I haven't actually seen that done. So yeah, good question. I'll have to look into that. 
Okay. And this may be out of the, the scope of our program today, but we had a question on the, what type of feed and heat stress mitigation do you recommend? Yeah, I'll probably throw that one back to maybe Jen or yourself. You guys are, are more on the expertise on the nutrition side of things. I, I don't really, I'm more of a facilities guy, so I don't get into the feeding strategies. Jen, do you have any thoughts? Um, yeah, I would just comment, maybe not necessarily changing the type of feed, but how we handle the feed, right? So uh, maybe if we're only feeding once a day, uh, maybe we decide we're going to feed multiple times a day so that we're constantly providing fresh feed. And then I also think um, how you handle that feed out in your feeding area, your, whether it's bunkers or bags, making sure that we're cleaning up those moldy areas because as it gets hotter, that feed will mold faster and we don't want to be feeding that to the cows. So making sure that we have clean faces off, off the bunker, uh, shoveling away any of that moldy feed off the sides of the bags, you know, keeping that area clean. I think those are major things that you want to look at versus maybe tweaking or changing major nutritional factors. Fred, do you have any other comments to that? Well, I would add, you know, cows require uniformity. They don't want to change things up too badly. So we really don't want to be changing our rations. Uh, I think feed bunk management and your pile management become extremely important for what you've said. But then I want to circle back and, and say, you know, if we've got our barn, our housing facility, our parlor uh, holding area uh, being managed well and keeping the cows cool, uh, we're probably doing everything we should be as opposed to making dramatic changes in our feed. Uh, please explain if the temperature is near about 45 degrees Celsius, how much sprinkler time can change and should be tuned on, turned on sprinkler after 15 minutes. Yeah, that's a good question. I just did the math on that because I had to convert it. So that's 113 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's pretty dang hot. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, in that case, I, I, it's just kind of, there's not a lot of research guidance on this. It's more, you know, just kind of keeping an eye on your cows and, and seeing how long it takes that water to evaporate off. And it depends on how long it takes to wet them down. So I would just go out and watch those cows, watch the sprinklers turn on and time it, see how long it takes to get them wetted down to the skin, you know, shut the sprinklers off and then time it again and see how long it takes until they look like they're reasonably dry again. And then you can kind of use that to base your, you know, how you set your sprinkler timer up is probably the best way to approach that. But you can certainly, you know, instead of waiting 20 minutes, for example, maybe you cut it to 10 minutes when you get into those really hot temperatures. We had a comment that that'll require manual adjustment. And I think that's a big part, as you said, look at the cows. What are they telling you? And then as those temperatures become more stressful, you may have to make adjustments. We definitely would invite you to uh, come back uh, next month. We're the third Wednesday of the month. Next month's topic is going to be uh, on uh, controlling bird infestations in our dairy barns. So thank you very much for attending and we'll see you next month.